looked at as a part of the entire planet, the sea on which all life depends is a film of water almost too thin to perceive. My first love has always been the sea. I discovered that humpback whales sing songs and that the voices of some species can carry across oceans. After years of studying whales, we now have our own research vessel. Throughout my years studying whales, it's become increasingly evident that the problems they face are getting worse. When you spend a lot of time at sea, it's soon obvious that humans are devastating the oceans with toxic substances. We do this because of our false impression that the oceans are infinite. And that's what this program is about. We ask this fragile ocean to dissolve and absorb and purify and render harmless all that humanity produces. We live in a crowded world in which there are more people alive today than the total of all our ancestors during the entire 100,000 year history of our species. For about 95,000 years, the total number of people alive at any one time was the same as the number of people we add to our present world every two days. Many people seem to feel that the developing nations are the problem. But in the Western world, our consumption of resources is way out of line. In America, for example, we use 25% of the world's resources, even though our population is only 5% of the world's population. That means that as regards energy, America stresses the world more than two Chinas and 15 Indias. All we produce must, of course, eventually be thrown away. Cars, planes, houses, telephones, televisions, computers, paper, plastics, tires, even the factories that made these things eventually wear out and get thrown away, leaving behind nothing but the discarded goods they produced and all of the pollutants they discharged. The law is that everything we produce eventually ends up in dumps and everything that ends up in dumps eventually leaches out into the water and from there into the sea. This is the highest point on the east coast of America, south of Maine. It's a mountain of garbage from New York City, 150 feet high, and is already the largest trash pile in the history of the human species. It's located on a small island, surrounded by the sea. Much of what we make employs synthetic molecules that never existed in nature before we created them, but which we now produce in huge quantities. Even the lotions that wash off our bodies can create major stresses for some wildlife. It's early to see the effects of the chemicals we produce on the oceans, but we can clearly see their effects on the largest bodies of freshwater on Earth. This is Lake Michigan, one of the five Great Lakes. Bodies of water so vast, it takes ocean-going ships to cross them safely during passages that lie out of sight of land for days at a time, and that sometimes encounter storm waves as big as those in ocean gales. As the largest lakes on Earth, they are the mother load of fresh water. And how do we use this priceless resource? Cities on their shores drink from the lakes, but incredible as it may seem, they also use them as cesspools and as dumping grounds for some extraordinarily poisonous industrial wastes. 
Up until the 20th century, about all that human cultures left behind was ashes, masonry, and a few bits of broken crockery. But in my lifetime, chemistry has flourished, and our industrial wastes now include immortal poisons. As many freshwater oceans, the Great Lakes are a distant early warning about what will happen to saltwater oceans. We haven't yet measured the effects on the seas of our immortal synthetic poisons, but we do know quite a bit about their effects on Great Lakes wildlife, even on the very symbol of the United States. If you haven't noticed yet, as I walk by, take a real close look at this eagle's beak. She does not have a normal beak. Her beak is severely deformed. Her top and bottom beaks do not match up. They cross over. We know quite a bit about our bald eagles in Michigan. We've been studying them for a long time. Scientists have done a good job of trying to ban all the young eagles in every nest every year for a long time. And last summer, as researchers were checking out eagle nests and banning the young birds, there were four different eagles that were found in our state that had problems. Three of them, including her, had a deformed beak. Another one had a deformed foot. The eagles that live closest to the Great Lakes, their young aren't surviving very well. And the same kind of thing has shown up for other animals that eat fish. It's not just eagles. Some birds called cormorants and terns, some mammals too. And you know what? They have two things in common. They all eat fish, and the ones that live closest to the Great Lakes aren't doing as well. So a lot of people are concerned. Is there a problem with the water and fish in the Great Lakes? We do know there are some things there that we don't want to be there, some pollutants. There was a chemical used many years ago called DDT, and it still shows up. Some newer chemicals called PCBs. We do know that in some animals, they can affect their ability to have young. And so scientists are now doing several studies to look at that problem. She is part of that study. Because you know what? If bald eagles are doing really well in Michigan, there's a good chance the Great Lakes are doing well. But the Great Lakes aren't doing well, and one of their chief problems is chlorine, which is used as a bleach in paper mills. Chlorine isn't the only problem. Fluorine, bromine, and other halogens are also ingredients of some of the most poisonous and persistent substances known. They're called organohalogens. Things like DDT, PCBs, dioxins, including Agent Orange, and so on. Some of them mimic female hormones, causing devastating effects at incredibly low concentrations. Once they get into the water, how do these molecules get into people? They do it by hitching a ride in the fats of animals in the food chains that lead to the fish we eat. We're not the only victims of organohalogens. Among those seriously affected are two kinds of seabird that eat Lake Michigan fish, terns and cormorants. Jim Ludwig first studied birds here in the 1960s, finding cormorants with crossed bills and malformed feet, along with other abnormalities that are symptoms of DDT poisoning. But many years after DDT had been banned and the bird colonies had started to recover, Jim began to find the same kinds of problems appearing in the colony and realized that something else must have been at work. He found high levels of organohalogens in the fish on which these birds are feeding. Many of the eggs in the colony hadn't hatched, so Jim retrieved those with dead embryos. For years, he's seen a hundred times more deformities here than average. You go down the bay that way, you get into the paper mill discharge PCB problem. The water from there comes up the bay on this side and empties into Lake Michigan right there. Yes. And this is where they're fishing, it's right off the coast. They're, they're fishing right on the right off the coast here, so there's a very good chance that 
um, we'll find a lot of deformities in these eggs yeah. when we open them. Only a tiny proportion of the birds with deformities ever hatch. Most of them can only be seen by looking inside the eggs. This is a classic example of PCB involvement. The most classic example is edematous conditions uh, caused by uh, problems with the circulatory system. See the tremendous swelling oh, yeah. on this? Oh, good lord, on the yeah, head, yeah. On the head and neck. The bird can't generate enough blood pressure to bring back the fluid. And what then occurs is that this bird's all wound up in the egg like that, and it can't raise its head up and peck its way out. So it's all blown up with fluid, literally. All blown up with fluid, yeah. and it can't get out of the egg. Now, this one has mild abdominal edema, too. See right here? So on the belly, it's also swollen, yeah. That's what it should look like. 10% of the eggs we open that don't hatch will have a big embryo in it that looks like this. Wow, so one in 10. One in 10. Yes. And rarely you'll see them hatch and they're all swollen up too. Wow. So it's pretty rare. And we'll put this normal one next to it. The uh, lower jaw on this one is deformed. It's actually comes down on one side, some fused right here. The upper bill comes across and there's a slight bend to the right, and it's deformed as well, right here at the base. You got a double deformity in this one, both jaws. This chick has what we call uh, gastroschisis or split belly phenomenon. It's uh, tissue that should uh, knit to form the belly, fails to grow, actually degenerates, and it, the chick's unable to reabsorb its yolk sac. And the yolk will have 99.6% of the PCB contaminants and other wow. uh, contaminants in it. That's where the fat is. Yep. That's where the contaminants are. And you can see there's actual tissue degeneration going on here because of the uh, hemorrhaging, like right in there. So those are actually organs that never made it back into the body. That's right. There, you're looking at the liver and at the stomach and, and you know, all the parts you need. Here they are on the outside. Classic symptoms of PCB and dioxin-like poison. What has happened to the Great Lakes will soon spread to the seas. These mute, dead embryos are giving us a warning, shouting at us, really, about a problem that threatens not just their lives, but ours as well. Can anything be done? Absolutely. This is a paper mill that releases no chlorine at all. The Sodracell paper mill in Sweden saw a growing market for totally chlorine-free paper. The heart of their process is bleaching vats that introduce hydrogen peroxide, a substance that is derived from water and which degrades back to water. The Swedes are working with environmentalists instead of fighting them in expensive court battles to make their factory even cleaner. Soon it will be a closed loop system. No toxins will be released into the air or water. Of course it took money to change the plant, but Sodracell's order book is full, and soon the process will cost less than chlorine bleaching. This factory shows that we can keep up with the world's massive appetite for things like paper without causing terrible pollution. 
there's a huge market out there for environmentally friendly products. This house is the place I spent the summers of my childhood. It was almost exactly 50 years ago, almost this week, that my mother had bought a new and wonderful substance. It was called DDT, and it came in a bomb that looked like this, called a bug bomb. And she put it on our garden, which is right over here behind us. Now, of course, the garden in these 50 years has grown up completely. There are no longer any vegetables on it. It's only now trees. But because it was DDT, and because DDT breaks down into a product called DDE, which is almost as poisonous as DDT, about 50% of what we put on the garden 50 years ago is still on the garden. Only now, of course, it's on the woods. That's the problem with this compound. It lasts basically forever. Chemicals that we now know to be of an appalling nature were sprayed to kill weeds and insects. When organohalogens were first introduced, the government created an ad campaign to convince us that they were safe. Manufacturers dismissed the arguments of respected scientists by trying to discredit them. Together, they have left us with a deathly legacy. But we haven't learned from the past. U.S. golf courses, together with our lawns, exceed the area of Pennsylvania and Rhode Island and are a major target for herbicides, many of which are organohalogens. Our wall-to-wall -wall carpets of grass need chemical cocktails to handle their many problems. And what happens to these chemicals? They kill birds or run off into ditches and from there into streams and rivers and finally into the sea. Just because something isn't labeled poisonous doesn't mean it's safe. After all, virtually every problem we now have is from some substance that was advertised as safe and later acknowledged to be dangerous. Sometimes the consequences of what we do are unpredictable. In 1918, fire ants were introduced by mistake to Alabama. They spread like wildfire until a new organohalogen called Myrex was concocted to kill them. It got spilled into the Great Lakes near where it was made and devastated beluga whales in the St. Lawrence River half a continent away. Uh, salmon were being stocked in Lake Ontario at that time, program being uh, promoted and Myrex was building up in the salmon. And we also had traced it into birds so we knew it was very widespread. Uh, in the Lake Ontario ecosystem, and we knew it was beyond that. It was going into the St. Lawrence River and on into the uh, Atlantic Ocean because that's the route that uh, these pollutants take. I wasn't just concerned about Myrex, I was concerned about a whole array of pollutants that were going that same route. Uh, different sources, PCBs, uh, the pesticides, Dieldrin, DDT, Chlordane, and I was very concerned that the salmon that people were going to be eating didn't have warnings on them that these fish were that loaded with pollutants. The New York State Department of Wildlife Conservation was promoting fishing in the Great Lakes while warning people not to eat the fish. Was anyone listening? All right. Yeah. That's the yeah. All right. Man. That's what we gotta catch, Chris. <laughs> Oh, shit. Shit. Holy the there. I got my net involved Thanks there. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Never catch one like that on the night away. Police are down here. All right. <laughs> what is it? No, walleye, no, walleye. That's a walleye. Yeah. That's a walleye. Oh, my Beauty. What are you going to do with it? That's a walleye. That's that's a best eating fish. Yeah. Believe me. Yep. That's a good one. Oh, I'm going to when you eat fish from the St. Lawrence River or Lake Ontario, you're getting a variety of toxics. You're getting dioxins, dibenzofurans, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, DDT and its metabolites, dieldrin, chlordane, Myrex. You're getting all these and, and usually uh, some mercury and things of this sort as well. 
uh, all in the flesh of the same fish. So it's a sad story. It's again people who were warning about this kind of a problem a generation or more ago should have been listened to because it's so difficult to clean these problems up in the environment once they occur. It shows the real importance of preventing these kinds of problems from ever occurring in the first place. And where have they already occurred? The link between the upper Great Lakes and Lake Erie is the Detroit River, where a series of abandoned industrial sites are sources of a host of organohalogens. Having carelessly spilled these pollutants, many industries simply pulled out, leaving whole plants and their PCB-soaked sites in their wake, disintegrating more each year and leaching into the river. The river is not only a main waterway, but also part of a system of roads and railways that bring in the raw materials used by industries. Having been beaten and pounded and heated and formed, they are exported to the world at large, taking a whole series of pollutants with them, either as components like brake fluid in cars, or as chemicals shipped by tank cars to other places. Poisons don't leave cities only by land and water. They also go out by air. An incinerator burns the sludge left over after a sewage plant has done its work. The sludge contains industrial pollutants, which the plant can't treat, so they are just burned along with everything else, making some organohalogens into worse compounds, most of which eventually end up in the sea. And when it rains, the drains simply overflow, taking everything into the river and blighting the communities around them. But plants help communities, and marsh plants thrive in polluted waters and clean them. This place is referred to as an aquaculture plant rather than a sewage plant. It has 24 ponds, 420 feet long, 35 feet wide. Hyacinth, a kind of water lily, considered to be a major plant pest in many parts of the world, is introduced into the wastewater along with insects and fish. Wastewater is the slurry that flows through municipal sewage pipes and includes mostly water from sinks, toilets, washing machines, dishwashers, and it contains human urine as well as excrement, detergent, cleaners, decloggers, soaps, and other personal hygiene products, as well as a miscellany of other chemicals, including a variety of industrial wastes. This place has an entirely different feel about it than the typical gray, lifeless sewage treatment plants you find everywhere. As I sit here, the wind is blowing the smell of the pond directly across me, but I can't smell any unpleasant odor. I see a variety of harmless insects like dragonflies, bees, and so on moving over the vegetation, and I can hear the songs of birds and see herons, bitterns, egrets, plovers. Mosquitoes are naturally attracted to ponds like this one, but that's been taken care of in a very interesting way. This is an entirely pleasant environment, and the way they get rid of the mosquitoes here is by mosquito fish, which they introduced along with the water lilies, and by sprinklers, which discourage mosquitoes from laying their eggs if you turn on the sprinklers at dusk. Life on Earth is utterly dependent on water. 
water once brought life from the sea onto the land, but now it carries death from the land into the sea. Some say that the solution to pollution is dilution. However, if the poisons are organohalogens, they are almost insoluble in water, but lodge in any fat, and all living plants and animals contain fats. Billions of creatures devote their entire lives to collecting dilute poisons and passing them back up the food chains to us. When a fish eats, it gets all the poisons its victim ate in its lifetime. The concentration of poisons increase about tenfold at every step up a food chain. There's a million times as much poison in a fish living at the top of a six-step food chain than there is in an equal weight of plants at the bottom. Great Lakes scientists Joseph and Sandra Jacobson have shown that this is having effects on the children of mothers who eat lots of fish. They used a test that measures short-term memory of infants by noting how long they look at each of two pictures. The test showed that children of mothers who ate lots of Lake Michigan fish had worse short-term memory. When a mother breastfeeds, she dumps organohalogens into her infant. There are, of course, many advantages to breastfeeding, but the fact remains that these poisons do stay in the body until the child grows up. If it's a girl, she passes them on to her own fetus, where, at its earliest stage of development, they do much more damage. Um, the highest exposed mother had 2.6 parts per million in her breast milk. PCBs. Of PCBs, right. And the, um, we saw effects in infants where the mothers had one and a quarter parts per million or more. But couldn't you say that at 2.6 parts per million you're higher than the federal government standard at 2 parts per million and therefore that mother wouldn't be allowed to sell her breast milk? Yes, that's true. Addressing the problems of the Great Lakes is the International Joint Commission, run by the U.S. and Canada. Its members are concerned about a recent U.S. Environmental Protection Agency re-evaluation of dioxins, which was made in the hope of relaxing the extremely stringent levels that industry has to abide by. In terms of the levels which are actually in the average population, the average North American population at the moment, and the levels which um, you would expect to find toxic effects occurring, those levels are about equivalent. And I think that was the real shock. I think people felt they had a bit of uh, room there, but there is no room at all. And I think in terms of the kinds of uh, stringency which we have to place on dioxins and dioxin-like chemicals, um, I don't think there's going to be any change. Um, certainly there's going to be no relaxing of the rules. The twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York are about a quadrillion times the size of a single piece of confetti. That's the scale we're talking about with some toxins in the body. The systems that run this building are controlled by instructions, just as our bodies are controlled by chemical instructions called hormones, which control functions like reproduction, and are active in parts per quadrillion. Organohalogens can mimic hormones and change their instructions, producing disastrous effects at very low concentrations. Just as one wrong letter in the instructions that control this building might completely disrupt it. This manual is for the heating system. Here's a page that tells you how to start up the heating system when the winter comes on. Halfway down the checklist, we get an entry which is concerned with setting the master thermostat. It tells the engineer to set it at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If something like an organohalogen somehow changed just one character in this checklist, making the thermostat setting read 700 degrees, imagine what a profound effect it might have. 
a wrong setting might lie dormant all summer long during the time that the heating system was off, only becoming a problem when the system was reactivated for the winter. Just as a damaged hormone might lie dormant in a woman until she became pregnant and her fetus began to grow and feel the devastating effects. What we now understand in terms of the average population and the amounts of contamination both with dioxins and the dioxin-like PCBs, the actual levels which people are carrying around in them are at the levels where you would expect to start finding effects. And I think the people who did this re-evaluation got a real shock at that point. This is the Niagara River, where it plunges into the Niagara Gorge, and behind me is the Canadian Falls, over there are the American Falls. This is a place which has attracted honeymooners and lovers for the last hundred years. It's also a place that has attracted industry, industry which uses the abundant electricity generated in these falls as a means of dissociating brine and turning it into chlorine, which is then used for halogenated hydrocarbons. The result of that is some of the worst pollution anywhere in the world. And where it comes into this river and then goes down into Lake Ontario and from there into people's drinking water, among other things, is in another little tiny waterfall over there. That small waterfall is actually the outfall of the sewage works of the town of Niagara, a town of 70,000 people. Just next to Niagara is this open green area, where early this century, a businessman named Love tried to build a canal to bring shipping around the falls. His plan failed, and it left an empty pit until the 1940s, when chemical companies began dumping dioxin wastes into it. Once full, Love's canal was capped with turf, and the land sold for housing. Until the late 1970s, Love Canal was a thriving suburban community, but now it's an all but totally deserted ghost town. The lawns are neatly clipped, everything's in its place, but there are no people, no cars in the streets or driveways, no sounds of children playing. What happened? Love Canal residents began noticing smells and strange fluids that collected mysteriously in their basements. Several children became ill, and slowly the terrible truth came out about what underlay their community. In the end, the houses on the canal itself were torn down, and those on the streets next to it abandoned. But dumps will always leak, because pollutants escape through cracks in the bottom. Uh, you go back to these sites uh, in 100 or 200 years, and they're still going to be loaded with pollutants. Okay. Plus, in many cases, you have metals in there, too. You have things like lead, and you have things like mercury in there. And they're going to hang in there for a very long time, because they're elements. They, their half-life is even longer than Myrex and PCBs. Yeah, for basically forever. For basically <laughs> forever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're the fragile items in this environment. Those chemicals are much more persistent, I'm afraid. Yeah. Transformers were the largest use of PCBs and were distributed all over the world. Proper disposal is prohibitively expensive for developing countries where transformers contain enough PCBs to contaminate most of the fish in the sea. This uh, Hudson Falls capacitor and transformer plant used PCBs for many, many years. They spilled them while they were uh, making these capacitors and transformers. They spilled the PCBs in the plant, around the plant. Uh, they came down drains. Now they're still coming through the bedrock. There's almost pure PCB compounds, pure product, coming out of the rock into the river here in the summer of 1994. And that is 19 years after it became publicly known, generally known, that this plant and its sister plant were the major sources of PCBs for the Hudson River all the way to New York City and into the New York Bight.
However, they're just now unveiling a machine that might remove this threat. It destroys PCBs with a chemical reaction that reduces rather than oxidizes them. No emissions are produced, and 99.999999% of the toxins are destroyed. It all mounts on trucks that can easily transport it to problem areas. The seepage comes through the face of Niagara Gorge, just below Hyde Park Dump, a depository for enough dioxins to disrupt the development of every baby born for the next million years. They've erected that bit of cyclone fence to keep you from blundering into it, but they didn't mess up the view with any warning signs. So where does the seepage go? Into the river? and into the fish, and if you eat those fish, into your body. It's what moves invisibly down the St. Lawrence that has most drastically affected the lives of the Mohawks, who have fished this stretch of river for hundreds of years. Midwife Guji Cook has seen at first hand the drastic effects on her people. Our traditional people, our elders, already knew that things were awry, that things were wrong. The quality of the bird life, the quality of the fish, the quantity of the fish, the size of the fish, the stories I grew up with hearing in the St. Lawrence River that there were sturgeon bigger than the canoes the people would use. Um, tremendous stories from the elders of, of what the world was like before the pollution. It's not like what we used to see here. When I was a boy, uh, we looked down in this river, we, it was clear, crystal clear. We could see the sturgeon playing, swarming on the bottom. And it really felt good, you know. My parents used to take us to St. Regis Island on Sunday afternoon, and there's a lot of our, us kids, you know, and we look over the side and we see, we used to like to watch those sturgeon. No. But those days are gone. You can't even see the bottom anymore. In our traditional ways, we ha all have prophecies. And they would talk about a day that's coming when women would no longer be able to have children. And in a culture, again, whose whole, um, our whole Ag we're an agricultural cycle. Everything, all our ceremonies are geared to this continuous birth, continuous creation, supporting the earth, supporting the plant life, being, giving thanksgiving, and, be, and appreciating the natural world. The thought that we could never bear children, as a young woman hearing that prophecy was really, uh, that could never be. Like my grandmother scolding me when when the water would drip at the kitchen sink. Shut that water off. The day's coming when there won't be any water. And I thought, what a silly old woman. Of course there's water everywhere. This water here um, is contaminated to the point where um, about 15 years ago, they put out warnings uh, for um, pregnant women not to eat the fish at all. And uh, the men, uh, we're able to eat it, but only in small portions. Uh, it isn't what it used to be. We could uh, eat fish uh, three or four times a week and nothing would happen. Whether it's a chemical in a plant or a chemical created by a human being, the body still hears it. And really, what more do we need to understand that this capacity for continuous birth is being disrupted by these chemicals and I think that's the biggest fear I have about all of this. Uh, that was the time when they uh, were not too careful with, with how they disposed of the PCBs and so right now uh, the damage has been done you know and we cannot afford to cover it up. Uh, we have to remove the problem and if we don't then uh, our future generations can be affected. 
You know, we have a, a very strong law here in our council that whenever we deliberate on any question, first we must always look to the future, to our uh, grandchildren, at least as far ahead as the seventh generation, before we make any kind of decisions. And I feel that when uh, the decision was made to locate this factory here, uh, those kind of things were not looked at. They are now raising rainbow trout by holding them in pens and feeding them clean food. Gulf War fires were widely considered to have been the greatest environmental catastrophe of all time. These fires, however, did far less damage than the invisible poisons we have released on the world. Even when all 750 oil wells in Kuwait were raging infernos, the amount of oil burned was only a small part of what the world uses all the time. What are the alternatives to petroleum for making fuels and plastics? What would happen if we turned off the tap? One possible answer is all around me. We could burn alcohol made from crops and use the crops as well as substitutes for petrochemicals. It would give us a renewable energy supply, put people back on the land, provide fuels that burn cleaner, and save the subsidies now paid to farmers for not growing grain surpluses. It would also save the billions we spend when we fight a war to maintain our access to petroleum, to say nothing of the lives lost. The fact is that we can get the same chemicals from plants that we get from crude oil. That shouldn't surprise us. After all, petroleum is the ancient remains of plants. The products we now get from petroleum, such as plastics and fuels, biodegrade more rapidly when they come from crops. They could therefore be engineered to last as long and no longer than we want them to. Having served their useful lifetime, they will then biodegrade into simple carbon dioxide and water. Dr. Urshad Ahmed is devoting his life to persuading industry to use plant-based alternatives to petrochemicals. It is now possible to make um, um, literally uh, anything uh, in terms of plastic bottles and so forth from grains and, and, and renewable resources. Uh, for instance, this is a shampoo bottle made out of 100% sugar. This bottle contains shampoo. Now, we will, in most cases, end up using this product within a year. Then why do we need a bottle to package this shampoo whose life is 500 years? <laughs> um, and one of the interesting things uh, is, is that uh, that's what we have been doing, of course, uh, oh, uh, since, the, since the discovery of, I guess, liquid soaps and so forth. So now it is possible that if you used um, 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 uh, starch-based or a renewable resource-based uh, sugar or so forth for making this bottle, you can literally fine-tune its life to match with the life of the product which is inside it. So you should be able to, now we are able to uh, make a bottle uh, which will start to biodegrade on its own within a year. The amount of biomass the land is capable of producing is tremendous. Uh, in the United States, uh, a state of the size of Texas has enough land to supply or produce enough agricultural raw materials um, that would fulfill all of our needs uh, for making chemicals uh, and fuels uh, for the entire country. The manufacture of every car generates organohalogens and every gallon of fuel burned pollutes the world further. However, a revolution is on the way. In the mountains of Colorado is a think tank called the Rocky Mountain Institute, 
where work is being done on the new initiative to build a truly fuel-efficient car. It's also the home of futurist and research director Amory Lovins. To get uh, a car doing hundreds of miles a gallon, but very comfortable, safe, sporty, and, and uh, nice for your family to ride around in, coast to coast on one tank of fuel, uh, you need to combine two things. First, you make the car three or four times lighter than now using extremely strong, bouncy composite materials. This is a piece of jumbo jet floor. Uh, <clears throat> you make it uh, several times as slippery as now by having great aerodynamics and better tires. So it takes very little energy to run the car. <clears throat> you then combine that with hybrid electric drive. This means that the wheels are driven by special electric motors, but instead of hauling around half a ton of batteries that you plug into the wall to recharge, because batteries only have 1% as much energy per pound as fuel does, you carry the energy for driving range in the form of fuel, and you burn the fuel in any kind of little power plant uh, as needed on board to make the electricity. I firmly believe that in future, the world will get the vast majority of its power from a giant nuclear fusion reactor, whose reactants are gravitationally suspended, and that such a reactor will pose no new health problems. I'm talking, of course, about the sun. Every year, sunshine striking the Earth constitutes 6,000 times more energy than we currently use. Before we started burning them, the total exploitable deposits of fossil fuels, that's coal, petroleum, gas, and tar sands, contained less energy than a month of sunshine striking the Earth. The direct conversion of solar energy into electricity via solar cells is probably the future, but solar cells are still costly. In the meantime, here's an approach that already makes a profit. It's a solar power farm in the Mojave Desert of California. Sunlight is used to make steam that spins turbines and generates electricity. This plant produces 150 million watts. It doesn't need to compete for valuable agricultural land. After all, there are lots of deserts around. In fact, we make new ones every day. If similar solar power generating plants were installed in a few of the world's deserts, a total area just slightly larger than Arizona could provide all the world's power needs. It's not only sun that deserts have, many are also windy. The world's winds contain thousands of times more energy than we need. The wind turbines in this one valley prevent the emission of over three billion pounds of carbon dioxide and air pollutants every year. Each wind turbine provides environmental benefits worth more than its total cost. Wind farms provide solid hope for the future, but it isn't just fancy hardware that gives me confidence. Each time I go back to the sea, I'm renewed by the wind and by the stars and by the unhurried lives of whales. It gives me hope that the world can be saved. But how? Well, first we must reject the argument that greener industries cost jobs. We know they create far more than they destroy. We can boycott polluters and work to elect leaders who know how to make a difference and when all else fails, resort to lawsuits and nonviolent protest. Our ancestors stopped slavery, even when the entire economy depended on it. And in our lifetimes, the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall fell. These things came to pass simply because millions of people changed their minds.